introduction. I'm really happy to be here with everyone. And um, especially uh, Samson, Soshi, Kalia, and Clarkson for inviting me to, to give this talk. So in the next few minutes, um, what I will, would like to do is come back from a specific platform, open source library, and really try to understand what's, what we are having at the moment, which is a reproducibility crisis. And only to start in with a couple of examples, but moving on to some to understand the challenges and then moving on to some ideas. I'm not trying to be here, I'm just trying to let them be there and then let's see what happens next. But something that is very important is pretty much we all want to get there. Whatever you feel this, that's what we want to be. And, and we started seeing aspects of having open source code, open source, or open accessible data. But this is only just one aspect of the problem where we can reproduce things that someone else did using an open library, right? Well, that doesn't imply that that's um, correct. And we would like also to replicate those ones that are using different uh, data sets. And moreover, to move to more robust and generalizable approaches. And, but this is very important to understand. Now, I'm bringing a couple of examples just to set the scene. Um, let's have a look at the first one. So in uh, January 2020, uh, AI approach was uh, proposed by many others by Google, in this case, uh, Google Health. Great nature, very high, highly cited paper. And then um, in, when we started looking at code availability, of course, we have been there. It's very difficult to share resources, one argue that is very difficult in terms of hardware releases, and highlighting here that that's not feasible, right? Fair enough. But then a month later, 30, uh, 30, 31 scientists came together and pretty much sent a letter to the nation saying like, this is not acceptable, right? When we look at the paper, there's so many details that are missing, right? And, and that's the concerning aspect of that, right? Um, now, the second example is in my practice. Um, here, um, one of the first steps towards applying data science for surgery is understanding those surgical transitions on the entire workflow of surgery, okay? And the problem is based on using every single frame of a video to classify those cases. And that's a problem. And here I'm demonstrating this with an open data set that is collectative. Um, so, as everyone does in research, I'll go to the literature, we found what's the state of the art, and here we find that 90.3 accuracy is reported. And what is important is that they highlight how that is uh, done. Check, well done. Public repository, well done. Open data sets, well done. Check, check, check. And even when there's no money intention and everything is going according to the plan, so what we found out is that, okay, I just wanted to forget about the technical details, but we are coming from our lab. Okay, let's be the state of the art. We propose a long video transformer for surgical videos that we call Love It. Then we move on even to another approach where we actually forget the temporality and we look for all, only those key information aspects within the video that we call Skit we compared qualitatively in that the same data sets, love it, skid, and we're ground truth, and that's state of the art. And when we start comparing things, actually what we find out is that 90.3% that is not yet. And we looked at everything else, right? And of course, that's a bit frustrating. Um, that's what we found out only after a couple of revisions and reviewers and more papers to try to find out that that metric that was uh, that metric reported by that paper. They uh, use relaxed metrics, uh, relaxed um, yeah, accuracy, whereby uh, around the phase transitions, you wouldn't look at those frames, right? Fair enough. Just tell me when that happens, and that would make things easier, right? Just highlighting a few things, and I'm not saying that that's my intention. It's just what is really happening, even when you check all the boxes. And what I want to argue here is that it's not only academia that is uh, um, facing these problems. We are talking about uh, platforms that are out there. Instead, um, in this case, Google are proposing AlphaGo, AlphaZero, 
that uses reinforcement learning, and later on, attempts by Facebook to replicate this. Right? And then, even being big players, they argue it's impossible for them. So I hope I'm illustrating enough with these three examples, but let's see what, what challenges are there for, for reproducibility in general in science. Of course, I'm only listing few. There are so many more, as you know, but it's related to whether there's any kind of funding in your data or in your a question, research questions, whether you are not accounting for multiple hypotheses. And of course, we are dealing with approaches that use randomness, whether you are doing a randomized a clinical, randomized clinical trial or whether you are using AI. And we've been covering throughout the day documentation restrictions to code, etc. And from the surgical medicine point of view, data access is acceptable because, of course, data is sensitive. And however, in human clinical trials, this problem is not that bad because they have plenty of documentation even before getting to, to running a study. And we are in a world where publishers are suggesting uh, using openness, but it's not mandated. And of course, as we saw it earlier, you know, the talks is like, it requires a lot of skills to make it open and share it. And this is very important because it's still research is success is measuring different aspects that are not related to uh, maintaining uh, an open repository. And of course, even uncertainty in the job market where we have postdocs that they are moving constantly. Or, and, and that, of course, makes it very, very difficult for, um, am I? Yes. But when we are talking about AI and machine learning, even there are more challenges associated here. Of course, we have papers submitted to archive. That's very interesting. Thank you. That's, that's we're moving somewhere. But it's not enough. And of course, all the input repositories. And what we are facing is that models are typically consisting of numerous number of parameters that they rely on random algorithms, well, by algorithms that apply randomness to, to, to our problem. And that's used for different purposes, either because you use stochasticity on your optimization or because actually that's the way you can load data for training. And if we look at even aspects where big players are using to understand uh, to develop these models. Of course, that's costly, right? And everyone else trying to reproduce these ones, it would be really much impossible as what we saw earlier. And I like this one, like something that they describe nowadays in trying to optimize finding the best solution for a transformer model called neural architecture search. It's very impressive, very, very shocking how much cost is associated to that. And I'm not that familiar fully with CO2 emissions, but like what I understand is that that number is equivalent to a car five times what a car can uh, produce in the lifetime. So that's really big. Now, what should we do? Again, these are some ideas. I am fascinated very much by the community-based and collaborative approach that uh, the Alentary Institute is um, leading. And there's plenty full of resources out there in very different areas that I would suggest everyone to embrace and to put it into practice. But also, probably those big players um, producing large models, it could be probably an opportunity to start establishing partnerships with them from an academic point of view. And perhaps we need more approaches that are world garden where we allow reviewers or editorial uh, companies to get access to that data after NDAs, et cetera, so that they can actually evaluate whether that's reproducible or not. And what I would suggest, things are changing so much for AI in a way that those guidelines that were available for clinical trials now have been extended to AI. And that's pretty much something very, very recently. And of course, everyone's suggesting using data management plans. Um, and then um, providing questionnaires or layouts of categorizing where your solution is, depending if you have a testing data set, if, if you have all the steps, pretty much like a checklist. And I would highly recommend doing that. And how to avoid methodological pitfalls. And also starting looking at license agreements that are now data focused rather than only open source. 
And, and of course, all your workflows, all your pre-processing, post-processing should be properly documented, not only about the methodology. And I also highlight that how important cross-collaboration is with Steve, with a really like impressive efforts to make a huge community working towards a, a platform, right? But what happens if that community is coming from different uh, disciplines? Are we talking about surgeons, are we talking about policy makers? Most of them probably have those skills on data science, right? So it's still in the context of healthcare, it's not very clear how to start proposing or conceptualize these approaches together. And one of the efforts I'm working at the moment is inspired by the Allen Training Institute on doing data uh, groups. And what we are running at PICS in terms of surgical challenges, the idea is to use data as a platform for that cross collaboration, but really reaching a point that we are aiming for solving real uh, world problems. And with that, I would like to conclude that Again, surgery is a global challenge. We are literally living a reproducibility crisis. Um, but everything, as Rachel mentioned, everything can start from our own practice. And that's culture that we would like to pass on. And what I would highly suggest is also not only working on new models, but also working on benchmarks that we can collaboratively with other groups frame together so that there are platforms there to validate those approaches. And I touched on some ideas um, for moving forward. And of course, I will be very keen to hear more ideas. And I would like to thank my group, where we are working in many different aspects to, towards applying AI in surgery. And I will be happy to get a question. So thank you very much. Um, when it comes to, to the idea of open sourcing data, you touched on the fact that, like, especially in medicine, right, it's not just a matter of releasing the data you collect, it's also about setting up the ethics. So how do we allow hospitals to give us that permission? Because I think, to me at least, that's the struggle. It's not that I don't want to open source it, it's that the people that collect the data and give it to me tell me I can't. So how do we change like how do we change that? Or is that just on every individual person to think about it? Um, it's exactly the same question I'm asking myself every day. Um, but very key. Uh, in my practice, again, I'm taking months, even years, to get access to that data. Right? And even to be in a position to run a model and validate that it can work. Right? Uh, but at the same time, what I can show you is that even from big players like Siemens, they are even starting to, because regulators are asking, if you are proposing something and you would like to make it a commercial product, apart from your model, I want to need to know your rate because that's part of it. So we are actually talking about a chain of key players where the data will be passing on. And how would you control that? I think that is going to be very possible. And in my view, I think we need to move on to all the aspects where data remains local, but we're still extracting features that can be passed on um, in a collaborative manner. And yeah, that's, that's, I don't think there's a real solution. Thank you. Thank you very much.